Back in the day, pork shoulder was the most overlooked part that no one looked forward to eating. Who could have thought it would become a worldwide relish? George Hormel pork meat, now known as Spam, rose to prominence after serving soldiers in World War II. But did you know the franchise has a background story that not so many people know? In this video, we will take you through the history of the internationally acclaimed pork meat franchise. Of course, without George Hormel, there wouldn't be Spam. The journey started in Buffalo, New York, where he was born in 1860. Although of German origin, George was born in America to John George Hormel, a leather tanner, and Susanna Hormel. The family moved to Toledo, Ohio, shortly after George was born in the company of George's uncle, Christian Hormel, and a family friend, Ferdinand Heyer who worked at a leather tannery with John George in Buffalo. Upon getting to Toledo, John and Ferdinand established a tannery. The company was named Hormel & Hayer, a company that produced leather from sheepskins. George, alongside Ferdinand, would always join their fathers to lend helping hands at the tannery every day after school and during weekends. The company was up and running for a while until a financial panic hit. It was so bad that the company struggled. Eventually, the company folded up, causing the then 12-year-old George to quit school. George went in search of a job to assist his family during the lingering, unfavorable financial condition. His search for jobs led him to work in a meat market where he learned several skills. He knew how to trim meat and make sausage, However, George had to quit his job because he didn't get along with his boss, whom he described as tyrannical and brutal. Subsequently, George worked at a railroad company and some other places before returning to the meat industry. Later, George worked at his uncle's meat market in Chicago. As of then, Chicago was the country's epicenter of pork packing. While George was there, he worked six days a week and not less than 14 hours a day, learning how to pack meat. He was paid the meager amount of $1.25 a day in his uncle's market. Then one day, he realized he was unhappy, so he quit at 19 with his co-worker, Gus Wallering. The duo left Chicago for Kansas City, boarding one-way tickets. Kansas City had a growing livestock business, so they hoped to make a better living. Things didn't go as planned for the duo as they struggled to land a job. Shortly, George found a job as a wool buyer, a job that didn't last long enough, all thanks to his boss, who found his way into the company's treasury, stealing the whopping sum of $100,000. Now unemployed again, George went back to Chicago, where he worked for Hyde Dealer, offloading shipments. We all know working in a cargo company is never easy, but it wasn't any better with George. He was on the brink of quitting because of exhaustion when he was offered another job in the same company as a traveling Hyde buyer. Owing to the nature of the job, George traveled to a lot of places. His new occupation made him move to Des Moines, and he spent a lot of time traveling around his new location and Minnesota. George worked as a traveling hide buyer for several years until he grew tired of unending traveling. He went to his family in Toledo to cool off, and his father asked him a question that would lead to a huge turnaround. His father asked him, when are you going to begin working at something you can show me in 30 years? Then and there, George realized he needed to venture into a business of his own. But the only problem was, he had no idea what to do. George was still indecisive when an idea struck his mind. He called his friend Gus to co-found a butcher shop in Des Moines but Gus turned him down. 
Fortunately for George, a perfect opportunity surfaced while he was away on a work trip in Minnesota. One of George's customers, Anton Friedrich, had just lost his meat shop to a fire outbreak. He renovated the shop, but never wanted to run the business anymore. George seized the golden opportunity to own the meat shop by buying Friedrich's share in the market with the $500 he borrowed from his boss. Due to Friedrich's unwillingness to join the business, George teamed up with Anton's son, Albrecht Friedrich, to establish the Friedrich and Hormel meat market. However, the two couldn't agree on a perfect way to run the business, so they ended their partnership four years after establishing the company. After ending the partnership, George started a new business named George A. Hormel, a company that specializes in meatpacking in the outskirts of Austin. George studied the meat market closely for years, and he discovered pork has the highest profit level since all its parts can be eaten. After his discovery, George ventured into pork packing struggling to survive in an industry already dominated by five leading packing companies. George's company doesn't come close to the big company's production level. So, to make a noticeable impact, George focused more on improving the quality of his meat through innovations. Unfortunately for George, another financial depression happened two years after he expanded his business. His business was hugely affected, causing the Big Five to encroach on his territory. Somehow, George beat the financial crisis. He borrowed money from his friend, and with the help from his family and new workers, he expanded his business to places like San Antonio, Minneapolis, and Chicago. George's expansion worked dramatically, and in no time, his company began exporting its products to Europe. 20 years later, the company is estimated to have sold millions of its products. After years of working tirelessly for the company to gain prominence, George appointed his son, Jay Hormel, to run the company. While on a work trip in Germany, Jay met an owner of a meat plant, Paul Jorn. Jay discovered Paul's giant stride of producing ham in cans for preservation. Impressed, Jay requested that Paul follow him to America to help with his father's meatpacking company. Jay's persuasion yielded, and one year later, the Hormel company produced America's first canned whole ham. The new product was named Hormel Flavor Sealed Ham, the product marked the beginning of greater things to come. In the last year of the Great Depression, the Hormel company decided to give a new touch to their product. The innovation happened after George had completely transferred the wheels of the company to Jay. To achieve the milestone, Jay chose to use pork shoulder in their product. Jay decided on Spam as the name of the new product after holding a contest in that regard. The product recorded massive success, and in a short time, it became an American staple. The product's popularity went over the roof in America during World War II. The fact that Spam was canned made it easier to deliver to soldiers, unlike fresh meat. Similarly, Spam was life-saving in the UK following World War II rationing and the Lend-Lease Act. Spam was the only available cheap source of protein. The then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, referred to Spam as a wartime delicacy. From then onwards, Spam has gone global due to its versatility. The Hawaii Islands is on top of the list of consumers of Spam. They love Spam so much that a Spam-themed festival is held annually where different Spam recipes are showcased. Spam has found its way into a handful of dishes and recipes in the UK, like the Spanish omelette, Spam hash, and Spam Yorkshire breakfast. Similarly, Spam has infiltrated both Southeast Asia and East Asia. In fact, 
Spam is regarded as one of the best gifts to give out in South Korea. This is the story of how unwanted pieces of pork saved hundreds of millions of lives during World War II and later became a world-famous product.